All right, welcome movement specialists to another edition of Triplane Function, where we're going to take a muscle, make it relevant to you so that you can see it, so that you can feel it, so you can move it, and so that you can teach it. All right, today we're going to be doing your internal and external obliques. We're going to take them in a pair because functionally, especially whenever you're standing and moving, they work very, very much together. Before we talk about how that muscle actually moves, let's go ahead and use this TheraBand as a visual aid to show where it attaches. Do this at home, please. Get out your TheraBand. Do exactly what, what we're going to do with Steve here so you can feel that TheraBand stretch as you move. And if you really pay attention, you're going to be feeling those underlying muscles. The internal and external obliques also work for you so that you can better feel it. Okay. We're going to be doing the right external obliques and the left internal oblique. Okay, so throw the TheraBand around your right shoulder. Take this here. Drag it all the way around, all the way in the front as well as the back. And we'll go ahead and hold on to both ends at your side. This is going to look like that homecoming sash. See, were you homecoming king? I wasn't even nominated. <laughs> I would have nominated you. All right, so. As you can see here, do the external obliques go all the way past your pec and all the way around your shoulder? Of course not. But I want you to, this will heighten your awareness to this portion from here all the way to here. This external oblique here starts at ribs 4 through 12. So in all actuality, this external oblique is a lot bigger and wider than this TheraBand. It would go from here to here. And it goes this direction, and it starts to invaginate with the linea alba, which is going to be right in the center of those abs. This is a deeper muscle than your good old six-pack rectus abdominis. And, and so right here, we're going to talk about that left internal oblique. That left internal oblique attaches to that iliac crest, so your hip bone right there, and, travel, and also your inguinal ligament. So again, just like the external oblique, this is a little bit wider. So if I were to come here and really widen this out, it also even attaches on some of your lower ribs. It comes up and inwards, and it also attaches through that linea alba as well. So remember, right external, left internal oblique. Now, what is this muscle most commonly known for? Well, a lot of people like to do bicycles, these kind of twisting exercises when they're lying down. And when you concentrically contract, when those muscles shorten here, bringing this shoulder towards this hip, you can see that that exercise is effective for concentrically, contract, concentrically contracting the right external oblique and the left internal oblique. Stand straight up. So that's not a bad exercise, but in upright function, moving through all three planes of motion, we know that this muscle will do a whole lot more. So let's explore that. Steve, go ahead and, in the sound play, go ahead and just flex your chest forward for me. This is where it shortens. More importantly here, go ahead and extend for me. This is where this external oblique, and you can see how this stretches out here, will eccentrically control any motion backwards. If you don't have that control to go backwards, you could be ending up with a back ache. If this external oblique is dormant and tight, it might drag the shoulder down, give you some shoulder impingement, all because it is dragging you down. So that's the sagittal plane. In the frontal plane, Steve, do me a favor. Let's reach this right hand up and over your head. If I just help stretch this out, you're going to see how this motion in the frontal plane also elongates this muscle, this external oblique. Last but not least, Steve, let's take this hand and reach all the way back behind you. And this is probably about the magic of this external oblique. You'll see how this is really eccentrically elongating this, this right external oblique, as well as it eccentrically starts to elongate this internal oblique on this side to really wind them up. Think about anyone that is a tennis player, an overhead pitcher, anything that you're doing where you're reaching backwards like this. Can these muscles effectively not only contract real fast like in a bicycle exercise, but can it elongate and control this deceleration back behind you? That's a really important part of these obliques, this twisting motion. A lot of times what's forgotten is this poor little internal oblique on this opposite side. It attaches to that pelvis. Do you think it has some control on where that pelvis goes, especially when you're running, especially when you're walking? Steve, do me a big favor. Take a really big step forward with that right foot. 
as you can see here, and really keep this tight so everyone can see, it's not only somewhat elongating up here, especially if he stays nice and upright, but this internal oblique on this side is starting to lengthen. In the sagittal plane here, if this internal oblique doesn't help slow his pelvis from anteriorly tilting so much, he can start hinging at his lumbar spine. That can cause a big backache. We talked about a little bit about that in the rectus abdominis video that we posted earlier. More importantly, that this internal oblique is a little bit outside of that. It has a lot more control of this frontal and this transverse plane. In the frontal plane, you will see if he shifts his hips to the right, right here, this will elongate it even more. It, it lengthens it. A lot of people that can't eccentrically control their pelvis from dropping down, it can be due to this internal oblique. Most people call this a gluteus medius lurch, or a Trendelenburg sign, when someone walks and their hip just juts all the way out. A lot of times they just blame this butt for not doing the work. That could be partially true. Are you looking at this opposite side internal oblique, controlling that frontal plane motion? And this Trendelenburg gait even gets worse because you can see as Steve is rotating his pelvis towards the left, you can see how his belt buckle, his belly button is facing that direction. If his internal oblique is not able to control that rotation, he's gonna really spin out. What about those people that have that medial heel whip when they run? Is it anything due to their heel? Is it anything even due to their hip? Potentially. Are you even looking, are you even thinking about how this internal oblique eccentrically controls that pelvic motion. <clears throat> when we understand how this internal oblique works by moving the pelvis, and we understand how this external oblique works really controlling this upper quarter, we get a really big appreciation for anyone that's a pitcher, for anyone that's doing any throwing motion, where they're really elongating their body, winding everything up, and then they're coming forward and really accelerating all the way down like that. So once again, understanding how your internal oblique here and external oblique work together to control where the chest moves and where the pelvis moves, you're going to be really helping a lot of your patients, a lot of your clients, a lot much better than just lying on your back and doing bicycles, right? So thanks again for joining us for another episode of Triplane Function. We'll see you next time. Thanks.